thank you very much, um, Dr. Kim, for the invitation to participate in the Grief Talks. Uh, my talk today touches on the role of disease and society um, in the economy in general. And to give you a sense of where I want to get started, we all know that COVID has upended uh, countless aspects of our lives. Uh, we often hear that COVID has been unprecedented in terms of the way you know, we work and study um, and the way we shop. Now, in my work, I want to study the past. So my goal today is to leave you with five lessons about the importance of disease um, for society and the economy using an economic history perspective. Uh, for my talk to make any sense, I need to start with a lesson zero, with a starting point. This doesn't count in the five, which is uh, for, for looking at the past, for that to have any value. It must be the case that COVID is not the first pandemic or even the first disease to have any profound effect on society and the economy. If that was the case, then it would make no sense to look at the past to get a sense of where we're going or to interpret what we're seeing. So this is the starting point. We are facing sort of a new reality, but to many, including especially historians, economic historians, that are very valuable lessons we can get um, from history. I also want to start with a few caveats, just to sort of put the talk in, in some context. Um, when I talk about disease today, I'll be very narrowly looking at what we call communicable diseases. And these are illnesses that are caused either by direct or indirect transmission. Transmissibility really is the essential element that I want to capture here when I talk about disease. Uh, direct transmission represents droplets. The reason why we carry masks around in response to COVID is precise, precisely because there's a direct way of transmission, but other diseases are transmitted indirectly through vectors, rats, fleas, mosquitoes, and so on. Um, I won't make a distinction between direct and indirect. As long as there's, there's transmissibility, that's gonna be relevant for me. Uh, second, I am a social scientist, and my purpose is to systematically try to understand the social world the approach I'm taking today is a positive one. It's not positive in the sense of not negative. It's mostly in the sense of scientific. And by that, I mean the following. Um, I'm not gonna be promoting or condoning any behavior or any view that we have. It's just an attempt to understand how we respond to certain events. Think of this as a doctor who's you know, psychiatrist or a psychologist trying to understand serial killings. It's not about you know, condoning that behavior, it's sort of the positive aspect of understanding what drives people to act one way or another. My point today is there's responses that society is gonna have. I'm not promoting or condoning any of those responses. I just want to understand them. And finally, I'm gonna keep all the technical details to a minimum. Um, there's proofs and there's detailed information about the results, and you can see some of my papers to find those, those results. I do want to give you one proof, and I'll give you one technical result. I'm going to try to express that in, in a single picture. So um, with those caveats in mind, uh, let me get started. And the first point of my talk goes back to a set phrase that we say in Spanish called salud, dinero y amor. And this is a phrase that we see as capturing the essentials for a happy life. So the first lesson I want to give you is there's, a, there's an economic value in good health. And for that, I'm gonna put you in sort of an uncomfortable position for a second. I'm gonna give you a, options from a thought experiment. And the options are gonna be two. I'm gonna ask you to decide between being rich, but sick or unhealthy, or being poor, but healthy. I often ask my students in class, which option do you prefer, rich and unhealthy or poor and healthy? And for some people, that's an uncomfortable choice. They take time, it's a relatively difficult choice. But if I sort of aggregate and summarize all the experiences I've seen when I ask people this question, the split tends to be 50-50. Now, that 50-50 split essentially signals 
signals something very, very clear. We value good health as much as we value money. In fact, if you look at the sad phrase, health comes first before money. And we see many other responses, responses like we tend to pay a lot for small reductions in the risk of death. We get better cars, safer cars, we wear helmets. All those economic sort of revelation mechanisms say, we want to be healthier, we value our good health. So it's not only that COVID is just not necessarily the first pandemic, but we would like to eliminate disease as much as possible. We value health greatly. Now, why do we value health? Why is that health becomes relevant from an economic perspective? Well, uh, from an individual perspective, for a single person, disease is essentially a biological process. I see it all the time when I have to assign a test or a midterm or a final. My students come to me saying, Professor, um, I took your test, but I, you know, I had a cold, I wasn't feeling well. And this biological process is such that Whenever we get exposed to infections, the energy available for work, study, even physical and mental growth get diminished. Now, this is a biological process and it has an economic impact. We cannot work, we cannot function effectively. My departure point today is different. Although sure, diseases affects individuals, disease rarely affects individuals in isolation. Most of the time, Large groups of people are the ones that get affected. Think of this as epidemic diseases or endemic diseases sort of established in particular populations. That means, and this is my second lesson, instead of just having an individual response, we expect a social response. Now, it matters in the instance of COVID, for example, because a lot of the tensions were social. The health cost, initially, fell on older generations, but the economic cost, the lockdown, fell mostly on younger generations. This is a social tension. It's not just about individuals. So I still have not, and it will take me some time to tell you what sort of response we expect, but we expect a social response. Of what form? That's what's coming next. For that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create, bring back some of economic models and economic theories to try to understand how should society respond to disease. And for that, I'm going to try to build a parallel universe, my own design. And the best example I could come up with was there's an episode on The Simpsons where Lisa puts a molar in a Petri dish in her night, um, nightstand. And out of the Petri dish, there's a whole universe that emerged. And this is a picture of that universe. I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to build a theory and I'm going to ask, in this theoretical world, in this made-up world, what do I see? How is society going to respond to disease? Now, there's three elements, and the three elements are essentially, first, I need people to be of two types, healthy and disease. If I want to understand disease, I need to have at least two types. Second, production and exchange are going to be social activities. By that, I mean no one is self-sufficient to just live on their own in the mountains. They have to exchange with other people or they have to go to work with other people. These are social activities. And third, in a particular community, in a specific sense, will hopefully become clear a little later. Meeting unhealthy people, meeting diseased individuals is unavoidable and is costly. With those three premises, with those three assumptions, people in my world, society in my world, responds to disease by creating some social barriers that essentially try to limit social and economic interactions. That's lesson two. Disease has a social effect, and this social effect is most likely associated with social barriers. Now, this is going to be the proof of those social barriers, and I want to spend a couple minutes trying to tell you the math behind it. So this is a world where I'm going to have the two types of people, and I call diseased individuals by the letter D and healthy individuals by the letter H. The 
the blue line represents how much they can produce when they are paired with healthy individuals or with diseased individuals. So the value here, FHH, says when I get two healthy individuals and I put them together, how much do I produce and I get these numbers? When I get two deceased individuals and I combine them and put them together, what do I get? I get FDD. Now, society is not just going to be about these two extremes. Now, what about a mixture of them? Now, the mixture where the theory is going to take place, where the action is, is going to be like the distinction we have between the weighted GPA and the unweighted GPA in the following sense. If I take a diseased individual and I combine that diseased individual, I group that with a healthy individual, the average, the unweighted average is going to be the red line, just the same distance on both sides. And I'm going to ask, how much are they going to produce if they get combined? And the answer, as it's reflected on the blue line, is going to be the red value. So clearly, it's not as high as the healthy healthy, but it's higher than the disease disease. Now, this is the relevant question from my theory. Should I try to encourage these pairs of HD, or should I try to encourage people to stay apart? Well, in the case of the unweighted GPA, if I break the healthy healthy, what I lose is this distance, the gap between these two values. It's a relatively small loss. What's the gain? The gain is I move up from the bottom to the red line. So the gain is larger. In this case, I should encourage those meetings. Now, this is where the weighted GPA comes. If there's a class that you like, it's really weighted, you know, has a high weight on your GPA, and you face the risk of doing badly, any bad outcome really is going to kill your GPA. How do we capture that in the theory? Well, the average when I combine healthy and diseased is not going to be the red line, but the green line. And this green line essentially means the losses that I have are exactly the same as the gains that I have when I break those pairs and combine them. And it means any value of the weight that pushes me closer to the D side, any value that turns healthy individuals closer to diseased individuals is going to be unproductive. So my goal in society is try to discourage those meetings as much as possible. We talk about segregation by disease. I want to separate individuals in this economy as much as I can. And I want to do it because when I combine them, healthy individuals look much closer to a disease case. They get infected, they get sick. So I have to discourage those meetings. That's the sense of social effects. That's the, ascent, that, that's the sense of social barriers. Now, the social barrier I was talking in that theory is particular. I don't want to encourage meetings between healthy and diseased individuals. What I want to do is give you examples of how those social barriers actually get enforced in society. Some of them are very subtle. Some of them are more explicit. And there's a list of those enforcement, you know, those barriers um, listed here. But essentially, what we want through them is to find ways to keep healthy and sick people apart. We want to minimize their interactions. And you were probably facing isolation with, you know, COVID started 18 or so months ago. That type of isolation is a social barrier. You're familiar with that now. I want to give you examples from the past. Um, one of those examples is the canonical caste system. Caste is a hierarchical organization of society, according to the division of labor and specialization um, in production. And what's particular about the caste system in India is it's organized along uh, principles of pollution and purity. It means something like this. The, the pyramid that you see here is a hierarchical organization. And it's a division of society in caste you know, that basically considers people above a pollution line, below the pollution line, and even individuals outside that pollution line. Uh, I'm sorry, outside the caste system. Like Dalits, we, we used to call untouchables. Um, one of the functions of caste, 
not just the specialization and production of labor, it's also the regulation of distance, direct and indirect distance. In that system, the physical proximity to particular individuals is polluting. Think of this as individuals that are outcast in the system. Now, impurity often he here often comes from particular production tasks. Production tasks like um, animal skinning, uh, leather work, scavenging, removing sewage or corpses, all those polluting tasks are avoided and are avoided to extremes because it's not just the physical distance that you regulate, even indirect distance. There are individuals that cannot be in the same room together. Even if they're not touching, even the presence of particular individuals, chandals are a group, a group of individuals that are in charge of removing dead bodies, they often have to be removed from the house. Now, this is a system that separates people, separates them along these principles of pollution and purity. And according to McNeil, William McNeil, the historian, this is a system that appears to be a social response to a very different disease environment from migrants in Central Asia. Once migrants got into the um, Ganges Plains, they encounter a very different world in terms of disease. They did not have the tolerances, the immunity, let's say, to the local infections. The social response, try to separate people and assign them to particular production tasks. This is a system that separates people sort of along the lines of the picture I mentioned. We try to keep these interactions between healthy and disease to a minimum. The particular point about the caste is it's not legally enforced. It is enforced by social sanctions. It's a social norm. It's not a legal norm. The most familiar form of segregation by disease today, and we all have lived it, are quarantines. Quarantine is a legal segregation of disease. It originated during the Black Death, and the map you have here represents, sort of depicts the spread of the Black Death um, in Europe. It was the first massive mortality event. Between a third to a half of the population died from bubonic plague, pneumonic and other variations. Uh, and it had one particular feature that helped sort of institute quarantines, which is it spread along trade routes. If you can zoom on the arrows and take a look at how they move, it came from Central Asia, it got into Messina and the Mediterranean, and then it spread all over Europe. Now, even though we had a very poor understanding of disease, we had no idea of the causal agent driving plague, the movement was so predictable that the natural response was to separate people and their cargo away from the port. And we did it for 30 days initially, eventually we settled for 40 days. Now, quarantines are a system that was like, like a trial and error. And even though we did not understand disease, according to McNeil, we probably were able to check plague for a little bit. It held sort of control the spread um, to the fact that plague disappeared from Europe quite early, relatively speaking. London has its last plague in the 1660s. Marseille is the last port in Europe experiencing outbreaks of bubonic plague, and this is in 1720. In other parts of the world, Istanbul, Cairo, they saw constant uh, visits of bubonic plague all the way until the 1890s. So quarantines, at least this physical separation, served this purpose of keeping healthy and diseased people apart. Um, one essential feature of the quarantine system, the regulation, I told you it's legal, based on legal norms, legal enforcement, but it was temporary. There are other mechanisms that we have tried to develop, not to deal with temporary you know, separation between healthy and disease, but with more permanent ways to do it. One of those examples is what we call the silent trade. You're probably familiar with the way regular markets work. Back in the day when we had um, farmers' markets, and this is exactly the way markets were organized during colonial times, let's say, we used to have a square 
And we used to have sellers coming to the square and buyers from all over you know, the town come to the square to do exchanges. In Latin America, the square typically had the major, sort of the political side, the police, sort of the enforcement side, and the church, sort of the religious side, overseeing the exchange. In Central Africa, in pre-colonial times, exchange was very different. And instead of centralized markets, they tend to take place in peripheral markets. Peripheral means something like this. If you have one town, representatives from the town will go to the border and align the goods they want to exchange and then retreat. The second town, the neighboring town, will send a representative, go to the border, check the goods that they have, and then make an offer. If this is a monetary exchange, they will leave money. If this is a barter exchange, they will leave goods. So they face the goods, they make the offer, let's say in gold or money, and then they retreat. The first group comes back, check the offer. If the offer is appealing, it's satisfactory, they take the money, leave the goods, and retreat. And then the other group comes back, seeing that the offer was good and was accepted, then they take the goods and they leave. It is exchange. But there is no interpersonal interactions in this protocol. Now, Historians have viewed these practices as a way to reduce contagious diseases because you contain essentially the amount of disease in one particular area. Now with COVID, one of the emergent, sort of interesting emergent things that we see is the rise of online trading, online exchange. Amazon was popular, it became more popular, and in certain parts of the world where it wasn't popular, now it's gaining ground. This is a form of exchange that also is not very personal. There is no physical contact between traders. Another permanent solution, and this is the last example I'll have, is the settlement in high altitudes. Before I tell you about that, if you look at the organization of society in Latin America today, most of the capital cities are high in the mountain. Mexico City, Quito, Bogota, these are places that are sort of established very high, very early on. And part of the reason for that establishment, Cusco, I forgot to mention, the Inca capital, it's the disease environment in the tropical areas, in the lowlands, was much more negative. And one way to avoid disease is just to move up in the mountains. It is one of the oldest and most effective protective, protective measures against tropical diseases. Um, and historians, we view that essentially as a way to deal with disease environments that are deadly along the coast. COVID has been similar in the sense that people have been fleeing massive centers, New York City and so on, and their prices actually, housing prices have dropped. This is a physical separation introduced because we want to avoid contact with the sources that cause disease. Now, uh, I told you about these three lessons, how we expect these social responses, how we see them in particular social arrangements. Now, lesson four says they matter. Even though these are historical instances going back thousands of years ago, they are still relevant today. Now, the quarantines that we see in the caste system, the social quarantines, still trouble India. Even though there's a legal restriction against discrimination, Breaking the caste system has been very, very difficult. Quarantines, the legal ones, have disrupted our normal life. And even though we are much more advanced in terms of knowledge, technology, the first response that we had with COVID was sort of the same response we instituted hundreds of years ago when we first faced a bubonic plague. Now, it's costly because Whenever we introduce separation, separation between economic agents, buyers and sellers, we are wasting resources. It's becoming more expensive for them to agree and to gain from trade. And when we move the center of production, let's say, from the lowlands to the highlands with capital cities in Latin America, Ethiopia and other uh, tropical areas, we introduce transportation costs. So those changes, those changes that responded to particular instances in the past 
created a sense of path dependency, and that is still relevant today. My last lesson uh, goes to just one final point, which is this. I have assumed in my uh, made-up universe that I can clearly detect who's healthy and who's not. And introducing social distance in that world is very simple. Most of the time, we can't. It's very difficult to diagnose disease. And in fact, society faces what we call a signal extraction problem. Instead of having a clear disease sign, we often have noisy signs, as in the game of telephone. We see something, not hearing, but we see something, and we think, is that disease or is that not disease? Think of this as someone sneezing could have a disease or could just have allergies and non-transmissibility. Now, the way we respond to a world in which there is uncertainty is different. And we tend to be very risky. Risky here means we deal with disease along two, you know, characterize disease along two particular dimensions. How dangerous is the disease and how visible are the signals that we get from disease. So when we face uncertainty, the way we tend to regulate distance, the way society tends to regulate that, is by having a better safe than sorry approach. Remember quarantine, remember early days? Even individuals who are not sick, who show no sign, are separate. We keep them apart. That's a preventive measure. It's like a you know, smoke alarm. We try to think of this as, you know, just better safe than sorry. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll risk it by saying, let me exclude people. Now, the feature that you get in this world of uncertainty is because we have no clear sense of who's sick and who's not, we're going to end up excluding people unnecessarily. Oftentimes, that leads to prejudice. And COVID, it has been clear in terms of Asian populations. Prejudice happen. So those are my five lessons. I want to summarize them um, and display them back for you to sort of remember um, at the end of the talk. Um, COVID is not the first pandemic or the first disease with profound effects on society. In a sense, that helped us because the past will give us information on how to move forward. And we want to move forward because health is very valuable economically speaking. Now, the response we have taken with COVID, as with many other past instances of disease, has been social and has been the promotion of these social barriers, social distance, we used to call. These social barriers are not new. They take many forms, like stratification in terms of a caste system, legal quarantines, restrictions in urban zoning that I didn't talk about, trade protocols where we try to keep buyers and sellers apart or producers apart. Those are costly, and they are likely to have long-term cost. So if we were thinking about COVID for the future, it's likely that we're going to have to do some social adjustments moving forward. Finally, disease is surrounded by a number of uncertainties. And we tend to be, you know, very sort of uh, try, to be, try to err on the safe side. A lot of the regulation we see in terms of disease follows a better safe than sorry approach. Um, those are my lessons for today. Thank you very much.